What's up guys, welcome back to the channel. Today we're gonna to be reviewing another flagship receiver from Yamaha. This is the RX-A8. All right, so this thing looks pretty big. Like I said, it's their flagship receiver. Let's check it out and see what we have inside the box. Shout out to Yamaha for sending this out for review. Thank you, Yamaha. So inside the box, we get an antenna, we get the calibration mic, we get the new Yamaha remote. That's pretty nice. I've never seen a Yamaha remote like that. It's got a nice soft touch finish. This might be a uh, waterproof or splash resistant too. That's pretty nice. This is a new style. I like it. Get some batteries, instruction manual, some documentation. Here's the power cord, another antenna, and here's the calibration mic stand. Ah, so this is pretty heavy. It's uh, it's 47.2 pounds. So this is the new style of AVRs nowadays. They're going with this center knob right here in the middle. And it's got pretty nice clean lines all the way through. This feels very premium compared to their RX, I think the A6 that I reviewed a few months ago. This definitely feels more premium. The other one felt very plasticky. This one feels more solid overall, but the volume knob definitely has some more weight to it. It feels, feels kind of heavy, like there's good resistance. There's probably, I believe an LCD display behind here. Up front here, we have touch sensitive keys for your different scenes. We have the control selector knob here. You can also press it for enter. Here's the power button, USB input, the calibration mic input, and the headphone jack. And this whole bottom part here feels like it's a nice aluminum. Looking up top, we have a nice little Avantage branding here. These grills here are plastic though, so I'm a little surprised to see that. I would have thought this would have been metal instead of plastic. So that's a little surprising. Let's spin this around. On the back, we have the antennas already pre-installed. Then we have seven HDMI inputs, two outputs with support for EARC. These will support 8K60 with a firmware update, but as of right now, this will support 4K 120. So no 2.1 support out of the box. You're gonna have to wait for an update for that. This is pretty cool. There's two XLR inputs two XLR outputs. So if you want to get higher audio, because this does have ESS Sabre DAX, so you should get some pretty good audio from it. There are your regular analog ins, also analog outputs for all your, your pre-outs, digital inputs, two coax. There's two optical as well, one out. And of course we have all your speaker outputs. This is an 11.2 AVR rated at 150 watts a channel, two channels driven at once. So it's probably gonna be a little bit less than that after you have all 11 channels going at the same time. So it's 150 by two channels. We also have the main power input, LAN connection, and we have your triggers as well. Size wise, it's your typical AVR size, which is 17 inches wide by 18 and like three quarters deep by about seven and three quarters high. Of course, this is gonna support all your smart home functions like, like Amazon Alexa, Google Home, all that stuff. So let's go ahead, let's get this thing hooked up in the home theater and I'll give you some thoughts and impressions. I'll be placing the Yamaha in my theater with 11 PSB speakers and two subwoofers. I'm also gonna be trying this out in my living room system, which is only a five channel setup using all Martin Logan SLM on wall speakers. The first thing I did was run the YPAL room correction in my living room. Once you plug the calibration mic in, the instructions will pop up on your TV screen. If you have more than one seat and want to measure up to eight positions, you'll want to click on the multi-measure box. The next option will measure the angle of your main speakers and the height of your presence or height speakers. Be sure the mic is at your main seat and click start. For the angle and height, follow the numbered positions on the screen. Once 
Once the calibration is done, you can see which speakers were identified, the size the receiver thinks your speakers are, which I got right in my case, the distance for all speakers in feet, the levels for each speaker, and the angle and height measurements. First option you've got is the settings pattern. This is where you'll store up to four speaker presets. Once you've made your changes, under Ampasign is where you'll choose how you've got your speaker set up. There's nine different options here, and you can choose between different power zones or different height channel arrangements. Once you run the room correction, it should also identify how your speakers are arranged as well, minus the secondary zones. Under configuration is where you'll specify the size of your speakers and the crossovers from 40 to 200 hertz. Under subwoofer, you can choose how your subs are set up and even adjust the phase. This can be handy if you can't reach the phase on the back of your subwoofers. Now, even though it's labeled presence, this is where you'll specify if the height channels are used as either height, which is against the back wall or front wall, or as overheads. For distance, you can make changes in 0.2 increments, and speaker levels can be changed in 0.5 increments. After you've run the room correction, you can see that there are four presets for YPOW, or if you want, you can manually adjust the 7-band PEQ for each channel. Under speaker impedance, you can change this depending on your speaker impedance at either 8 or 6 ohms. I do believe Audioholics has proven that you'd want to keep this at 8 ohms or else you risk limiting the power of the receiver. They've got a couple videos about it on YouTube if you want to search for it. Under sound, there's incoming audio information, lip sync delay, DSP parameter, and all channel stereo settings. Under dynamic range, you want to keep this on maximum so it doesn't affect the dynamic range unless, of course, you want it to. There's volume, pure direct mode, and adaptive DSP settings. Under virtual speaker, you can have the receiver create virtual front and rear height channels under VPS. VSBS creates phantom back speakers, and Dolby will create phantom height Atmo speakers. Under low jitter, there are three different levels for jitter elimination. Under DAC Digital Filter, there are three different attenuation settings which could enhance the sound quality. Balanced Input Attenuator will attenuate the XLR ins by 6 dB if high levels are being input. Here are two different options for outputting DTS if your player has trouble doing so. Under Scene Setting, this lets you configure a preset to be brought up such as a specific input along with surround parameter and volume level or other different combinations. Under Video Information, this will show you the incoming signal and what's being output. Under Video Mode, this will let the receiver process the video like changing the resolution, aspect ratio, and enhancing the image. You're probably going to want to keep this on direct and let your display do all the picture processing. For HDMI, you can turn on CEC control, ARC, and change the delay. And here you can change where the HDMI outputs are directed, for either the secondary zones or the main zone. You can change the HDCP version in this section. Here you can turn on and off the HDMI video pass-through if your receiver is powered off. For HDMI video format, you can see that this supports a max resolution of 4K60. Now this is on firmware version 1.1. If you haven't done so already, there is a new firmware update which will get you new features. Once you install the update, which took me about 20 minutes or so, you can go into the information screen and see that it's now on version 1.65. Since shooting this video, it's now been updated to 1.66 that addresses some music cast stability. Otherwise, everything is the same as 1.65. Now if you go back into the video format section, you'll see that there is now an 8K option with support for 8K60. Keep in mind that this does not enable VRR, so at the time of this video, VRR is not enabled for all you folks that like to game. Another thing that was included is Oro 3D. You can change the listening mode between surround and native, change the Oromatic preset, and change the Oromatic strength. Now while video is playing, you can bring up more settings by tapping on the option button on the remote. From here you can access the tone controls for treble and bass, which you can change in 0.5 increments. You can turn YPOW volume on and off, change the dialogue enhancement options, adjust the delay, turn on audio enhancer, 
change the input trim, turn extra bass on and off, quick access to video processing, and check the incoming signal information. First demo I popped on was Midway. If you want a movie with a lot of surround effects, this is one of the best. While going back and forth and trying different YPOW presets, I preferred the flat setting and found the soundstage was noticeably more dimensional while turning YPOW on and off. The front channels seemed to stretch outwards more with very good high frequency detail up top, and likewise in the surround channels. Since I'm not running subwoofers in my living room, the receiver did correctly identify the front channels as large and surround channels as small. Even though the SLMs don't have a ton of bass, the Yamaha easily pushed them to their limits with their maximized bass output. The Martin Logans all have a very smooth mid-range, and paired with the RXA8, I didn't notice any major sonic differences coming from my Emotiva separate amplifier. Moving on to more serious listening, I put the Yamaha in my dedicated theater space to power 11 channels instead of the 5 that I have in my living room. I popped on Ambulance which has one of the best Atmos mixes with insane bass and I ran all the speakers full range without a subwoofer. I tried turning YPOW on and off and I always preferred keeping YPOW on. I found the spatial cues easier to discern and the overall width and depth of my space sounded as if the walls moved outwards by a couple of feet beyond the speaker's physical locations. As reference, my normal system is a Trinov Altitude processor and a pair of Macintosh amps, so comparing the Yamaha is probably not a fair comparison, but the Yamaha definitely held its own. I could hear the low end lacked a bit of punch and extension coming from my separates, but I'm sure not many folks are going to be running 11 large speakers. The mid-range clarity remained smooth across the board and treble detail did lean a little bright, but wasn't edgy or harsh. Adding subwoofers back in and crossing over at 80Hz, I heard clean, precise sound effect movement among all the channels, and I was very impressed with how well defined the surround channels were. I've heard some receivers that sounded more congested in surround channel separation and distinction, but the Yamaha doesn't fall into that group. So hearing that gunshot in the back left channel sounds like it's coming from that back corner, and not like it's a combination of the left surround, back surround left channel. Another demo I threw on was A Quiet Place Part 2. These movies are great for ambiance. With movies like this, they rely on ambiance rather than loud explosions, so you want a receiver with a low noise floor and not hear a lot of hiss coming from your speakers. The RX-A8 stayed quiet during these lower volume scenes and only delivered the subtle effects present in the audio mix in a very detailed, large-scale manner. As I mentioned earlier, I do feel this had a slightly more forward presence if I was running this without room correction, but with the room correction on, you can also EQ out any brightness. I found the presentation not quite as refined as my separates, in that I can feel more air in certain scenes and there is another level of dimension and cleanliness to the sound, but that's just me being very nitpicky. If I didn't own what I own, then I'd be perfectly content. I also threw on the Batman and cycled through all of the DSP options. I personally would never use any of these presets for serious listening, but I will admit that there are a couple that will do some interesting things if you want to experiment. At the time of this video, the RX-A8 is selling for $3,300. When this first came out, they promised AK support with VRR and RO3D via a firmware update. $3,300 back then might have been a tough sell without those features for some, but I'm glad they delivered on the AK and RO updates. VRR for me personally doesn't matter, but be aware that it's still not supported. One thing that isn't supported is the Voice of God channel if you want to run a full RO3D setup. Another thing that's missing is the option for wide channels. I figured maybe you could run only a single pair of heights and then configure the amps for wide channels, but there is no option for that. I do believe you can do this in other AVRs. Aside from those missing features, my day-to-day -day usage after the updates has been pretty solid. I did have issues with HDMI ARC being reliable, but honestly, ARC has given me problems with every AVR and processor that I've used, no matter the price, so I don't even use it. I found the room correction did a very good job at opening up the soundstage, but it didn't correctly identify that my left and right back speakers were swapped. So that angle and height measurement option I guess can't tell where your speakers are located. 
I did measure my speaker levels correctly, but I did have to go in and adjust my subwoofer manually if I wanted a smoother response, but I still do that even with my Trinov, so no auto room correction is perfect. If you do happen to have 11 large speakers and want to run all of them full range, this will sound strained at louder volumes, so I would keep this crossed over with a subwoofer. Surround performance was excellent with proper placement of sound effects with very clean channel separation, and like I said earlier, very distinct surround channel clarity whether it's above your head or behind you. For two channel listening, I found low end performance drove the Kanta 2 speakers with no issues with great weight and control. The mid range seemed a little light in comparison to the Rotel 1582 I have on hand, but the high end detail had very crisp extended range. Overall, I do think this has a somewhat forward presence for two channel listening. I enjoyed the sound of the RXAA and it performed great whether I had it in my home theater or used it strictly for music. There are a ton of settings to get this setup and running for a multi-room setup so it is a highly functional AVR. If you're looking for a capable receiver that can handle more than one room and don't need video gaming features, then you may want to put the RXA8 on your shortlist. So what are your thoughts on the Yamaha RXA8? Have you gotten a chance to try one out and if so, how do you think it performs? Leave a comment down below and let us know. As always guys, thanks for watching. Be sure to like the video if you found it useful, and if you want to support the channel and get additional content, then stop by our Patreon page. Subscribe if you haven't already, and we'll see you again in the next video.